All right. Welcome to the Journal of Marital and Family Therapies Decade in Review video series hosted by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. The special Decade in Review issue is the fourth of its kind over the years and assesses the efficacy and effectiveness of couple and family therapy by reviewing rigorous studies published over the 10-year period from 2010 to 2019. The findings from this special issue show tremendous progress and achievements made to date, inspiring continued commitment to making marriage and family therapy and interventions widely available. Throughout this series, we'll talk directly with the authors who made this special issue a reality. Today's focus is on a very important topic, one that was added as a new piece to this decade in review, and that is reducing mental health disparities among racially and ethnically diverse populations. I'm joined today by Dr. Lakey Duanian, and Dr. Kendall Haltrump. First thing I want to say is thank you to you both for joining us here today. Uh, my first question uh, that I'm going to direct toward Lakey, please, is uh, can you sort of set the stage for us by talking a little bit about why you felt it was so important to make this its own article and cover this new territory in the Decade in Review? Yeah, thank you for allowing us to talk about why we felt this article was important and why we wanted to cover it. We know that previous reviews of couple and family intervention research has examined issues of diversity in clinical studies. Now, trends in these reviews have demonstrated some level of progress over time in addressing issues of diversity. And we wanted to highlight in the 2010 to 2019 period exactly how authors were reporting uh, increasing representation of racially and ethnically diverse individuals, couples, and families and mental health interventions. And we also wanted to understand what strategies researchers and therapists were using to address issues of diversity and engage in critically conscious research and practice strategies with individuals, couples, and families in the last decade. So we were really thrilled to receive and accept the invitation from Drs. Wittenborn and Holtra to co-author this article, especially given the concurrent context of the COVID-19 pandemic and undeniable reminders of how social and health disparities in the U.S. are linked to systemic racism, marginalization, and economics. The article is relevant for stakeholders in mental health care and clinical research as we're all responsible for engaging inclusive, equitable, and critically conscious strategies to make therapy both more accessible and more impactful with racially and ethnically diverse communities. Thanks so much. Uh, Kendall, anything to add? Yeah, when um, Dr. Wittenborn and I began our work as co-editors, we were discussing our vision for this special issue. And we knew that a lot of the authors were gonna take the opportunity to attend to issues of diversity and to disparities in their individual articles. And so we got just really excited about this idea of punctuating the special issue with a final article that would look across the different topics and present a more comprehensive perspective. So we reached out to Dr. Duanian. We also reached out to Dr. Ruben Paracardona, who's our co-author on this special issue article. And we just all were in agreement that an article dedicated to the topic of health disparities would be really important for providing not only a review of where the field currently stands in relation to this topic, but also um, to allow us to make informed recommendations moving forward with our research over the next decade. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question, let's talk a little bit about uh, what mental health topics you reviewed for this article and uh, what types of studies were chosen? Kendall, can you answer that? That's a great question. So um, we really had two main goals for our article. The first was to look at the extent to which racially and ethnically diverse populations and globally underserved populations had been included or perhaps not included in the couple and family intervention research. And then second, we wanted to look more specifically um, at the studies that had included the diverse participants and examine the research methods used. So since we were conducting this review in concert with the JMFT special issue, we really wanted to take advantage of, of this opportunity to connect our review with the hard work that all the other authorship teams had put in. And so um, for our article, what we did was we relied on the studies that had already been identified for inclusion in 11 of the special issue articles that were focused on mental health. Um, and so 
uh, we looked at a number of topics. So specifically, we looked at infant and early childhood mental health. We looked at disruptive behaviors, ADHD, uh, anxiety disorders are in there, mood disorders, uh, suicide, substance use, trauma, and then family violence, couple relationship education, and also couple relationship distress. So as you can see, um, we covered, a, a hopefully, um, a very comprehensive list of topics, and it was actually um, 271 different articles in total. Thank you very much. So uh, my next question is for, uh, for Lakey. Can you tell us a little bit about how systemic racism and marginalization have been documented as root causes of mental health disparities in racially and ethnically diverse communities? Yes. So the discourse on health disparities and the literature continues to show us that racism systemically and marginalization contribute to poor community mental health outcomes. There's a term called historical trauma that refers to community level exposure to violence and marginalization. And this term was developed by Native and Indigenous scholars to explain the community and intergenerational effects of exposure to systemic violence and racism. And this perpetuates harm in communities that are already charged with excessive expectations of, res of resilience and coping, and on top of that, have less access to quality um, and evidence-based mental health interventions. Now, in terms of specifics, research shows that income, wealth, housing status, geographical location, and other social factors are determinants of health, including for mental health. The reason being is that social factors such as economic strain and poverty disproportionately affect racially minoritized communities and perpetuate individual and family stress. This impacts health. Social determinants of health also impact communities' access to evidence-based interventions, as I mentioned before, and this further exacerbates disparities. So for evidence-based interventions to be delivered with attention to culture and context, it's imperative for us as mental health stakeholders to understand the broader historical and social factors that impact community mental health in underrepresented and underserved communities. We also have to acknowledge that racism does exist at multiple levels from the individual to institutional to systemic and in that we also have to combat racism individually, institutionally, and systemically. And that involves all the ways that it's very existing and persistent in the mental health field. Thank you very much. Um, for our next question, can you talk to me about the extent to which uh, diverse populations were included in couple and family intervention research over the past decade? and whether these studies were conducted with attention to issues of diversity or not. Kendall, let's start with you. Yeah, um, so your first question was about the overall kind of inclusion of diverse populations. So I'd like to share a little bit about the results that we found in our review. So we found that there were 175 studies that were conducted in the United States. And of those, about two thirds included predominantly white non-Hispanic participants. Um, so there were a third of the studies that we looked at that included a sample of participants that were primarily from racial or ethnic minority groups. Across topics, we saw that the highest percentage of inclusion was in the substance abuse intervention literature, and the lowest was in the topic of couple relationship distress. Um, and then we also looked at those international studies. And in our review, we found 92 studies that were conducted in international contexts. And of those, only 5% were conducted in low or middle income countries. And then another 3% were conducted in high income countries, but the um, authors identified that a racial or ethnic minoritized um, sample was used in that study. Um, but overall, there was uh, very little research on globally underserved populations. And then when we look at um, all those studies together, we see that in the review we found about 25% of the articles that represented the last decade of research on couple and family interventions um, were focused on um, racial or ethnically diverse samples or globally underserved uh, populations um, for specifically the studies looking at mental health. 
thanks so much. Uh, so uh, over to you, uh, can you speak to uh, the attention to issues of diversity issue? Yes, so for the second question, we examined the full text of 60 articles that included predominantly racially and ethnically diverse participants to identify strategies um, that research teams use to attend to diversity in relation to culture, race, ethnicity, context, community, history, disparities. Uh, we coded along six methodological dimensions, including personnel, eligibility criteria, the intervention itself, the measures that were used, we looked at the outcome analyses, and we looked at how these studies were contextualized. So I'll just explain a little bit about each and then what we found. When it came to study personnel, we wanted to assess uh, whether study personnel also represented the racial, ethnic, or language diversity of participants. So 40% of the studies reported using personnel that matched the racial, ethnic, or cultural identity of, of, of clients. Most frequently, we wanna note that we saw this uh, occur when there was a, a language match for non-English speaking participants. For eligibility criteria, we assessed whether uh, racial, racially and ethnically minoritized or non-English speaking participants were specifically included in studies and intentionally included. What we found was that 40% of uh, studies specifically included diverse participants. That means they either had full samples um, of specific cultural groups, so an intervention for African-American families, an intervention for Latino youth, or they were most frequently coded also when it came to recruiting non-English speaking participants. So for intervention, we also assessed whether the intervention was developed or adapted to fit diverse populations and or whether the intervention had demonstrated positive effects in previous studies. We also coded this one if non-English speaking language uh, was used to de deliver the intervention. 33% of articles uh, uh, either developed or adapted or mentioned positive effects of the intervention with a racially or ethnically minoritized communities before employing it in the study. For measures, what we wanted to understand was whether at least one measure that was used in the study was psychometrically validated with diverse populations. Again, whether it was delivered in, an, in a non-English speaking language or whether or not there were measures that included a variable pertinent to the experiences of racially and ethnically diverse communities. So if there was a measure on discrimination, um, racism, we found that 27% of our uh, measures were psychometrically validated or administered in non-English language. For the last two, uh, we assessed the outcome analyses and the contextualization of studies. For the outcome analyses specifically, we wanted to examine the analyses of focal outcomes related to race and ethnicity. So studies that were only controlling for race or ethnicity did not meet the criteria. Uh, those including minoritized only populations, however, did meet criteria just off of the, the uh, basis of including a full sample of diverse participants that were non-white. 28% of articles reported specifically analyzing outcomes by race and ethnicity. Uh, this was a finding that we determine in terms of the analysis of focal outcomes. And lastly, for contextualization, we assess whether studies were contextualized in relation to experiences of race, ethnicity. Uh, we also, you know, assess whether there was any mention of related topics to disparities, um, equity, uh, social factors, and an example of that uh, was that we would look in the literature re review or the discussion section and see topics highlighted uh, related to culture. 58% of articles actually by definition included at least some 
level of contextualization. Now, within this 58%, there's a range of ways that authors did this, range from more brief, brief context in many studies, majority of studies would uh, say something such as, we included a substantive percentage of Black families who are overrepresented in the CPS system. That was an example from one article that did meet the criteria for contextualization. And we also uh, were able to code more substantive offerings like studies that would describe uh, community disadvantage and how racial discrimination and financial strain collectively impede on relationship quality in families. So that was our, that was our framing when we were looking at contextualization. Thanks very much. Uh, my next question is about uh, what opportunities are there to advance the development and delivery of culturally and contextually grounded interventions uh, for couples and families? And Kendall, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, I guess I want to start by just reflecting that something that was difficult for us to disentangle in this review was um, what was actually done in the research studies in terms of methods versus what was actually reported in the research article. And when we were reviewing the articles, we can only track what was reported there. So the first thing that we wanna do is to really urge researchers to thoroughly report their research methods, especially their methods um, having to do with accounting and honoring race, ethnicity, and culture. And um, we just believe that this is important for communicating standards of practice in a field with other scholars. Um, and then also, um, we were thinking, yeah, it's, it's probably something that's difficult to do because of some of the um, journal page limits uh, that we have in place. Um, but we're hoping that now that we have more and more opportunity to submit supplemental materials um, along with our article submissions, that this might um, be a way for scientists, for scholars to communicate with one another what those, what those methods really look like in a little bit more detail. Um, and then in terms of the actual research, um, really to reduce um, mental health disparities among racially and ethnically diverse populations, we need to do a better job as a field of really centering the experiences of minoritized and underserved populations. Um, and that really includes conducting research that's intentionally designed to not only better include these populations, but research that's also characterized by these methods that do account for race, ethnicity, and culture. Um, and so, for example, we know that establishing a climate of trust and a climate of mutual rapport is important when doing research and it's especially important when doing research with historically oppressed communities, right? So um, a couple of things that we can do here is we can, um, we can make sure that we're establishing meaningful partnerships with community leaders. Um, we can make efforts to collaborate with and to employ service providers from the local community in our intervention work that we're doing. Um, and it's also so important for us um, as we're doing this research to, to take a look around and to critically examine the makeup of our research team to, to make sure that people from the focal population are really represented and they're really included in the project, um, in the project leadership, in the project implementation. So this could look like um, PIs and other researchers who are on the leadership team. This can look like research assistants, project managers, interventionists, um, assessment team members. So those are um, just some ideas that, that I have for, for this moving forward. Thanks so much, Kendall. Uh, Lakey, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, Kendall, thank you for mentioning that. I do wanna add to your examples, they're really, great in terms of emphasizing the importance of people and the people that we invite and engage into um, our research. And I wanna first talk about the importance of distinguishing intentional inclusion of first participants versus sampling from a population uh, or a context with a disproportionate amount of non-white people. And uh, we see this in examples such as studies conducted in prison systems and child welfare systems. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're intentionally recruiting 
uh, racially and ethnically minoritized and underserved populations, uh, not just out of convenience. And we want to increase our attention to engaging with them when they are, um, when we do invite uh, diverse participants into our studies. Representation also matters when it comes to staffing. Kendall, you touched on this and I'll emphasize a little bit more uh, that we have opportunities in training and hiring uh, in terms of advancing the development, the delivery and the implementation of uh, these interventions. We could be training more students and professionals in culturally adapted interventions, um, culturally adapted evidence-based interventions that can increase the accessibility to underserved populations. We also want to emphasize the opportunity to examine key life experiences, which Kendall mentioned. We can do that uh, even further within the measure that we use to assess racially and ethnically diverse populations' experiences uh, with mental health and engaging in, in our interventions. We also want to be evaluating more intervention outcomes among specific racial and ethnic groups more often. We are uh, seeing an increase in representation uh, across the board and specifically in some areas of the literature, um, not in our study, but previous reviews have you know, found representation differs in the couple intervention literature versus the family intervention literature. Uh, however, across the board, we could benefit from recruiting more studies with, for example, Latino youth, um, Asian American families, Native American fathers, et cetera. Thanks very much. Um, so what opportunities exist to enhance cultural adaptation efforts with racially and ethnically diverse communities? Uh, Lakey, let's start with you on this one. Yes, yeah, so there are so many opportunities to advance uh, cultural adaptation efforts. And I want to first start by defining cultural adaptation as the general process of modifying an in intervention for cultural and contextual relevance with diverse populations. It's often difficult to determine the level of adaptation or how nuanced the adaptation process was in studies based on what was reported in articles. And Kendall mentioned um, some reasonings behind that. So when we utilize a, a cultural adaptation framework, uh, first of all, we can develop a system to track both significant and nuanced adaptation processes that can substantially enhance later reporting in manuscripts. And at a systems level now, we would be really asking journals and publishing companies to help support cultural adaptation efforts by aligning both submission and review criteria to create space for more information on cultural adaptation methods, right? And so there's opportunities for us to uh, track and document within our research uh, context, but the, there's also opportunities at a systems level to invite more of this information, to keep building on cultural adaptation efforts. Now, there are a lot of dimensions that are involved in cultural adaptation, efforts and oftentimes it'll depend on the framework that's being used. One of the uh, pioneering and most frequently used frameworks involves uh, context, language, person, metaphors, content, concepts, goals, and methods. And this is a framework that was developed by um, Bernal and we see it used across the literature to attend to methodological efforts um, in studies. And so we could look at, for example, Bernal's model, the eight dimensions, and see opp where opportunities lie to focus on some of the dimensions that we assess, personnel uh, measures, uh, eligibility criteria, the intervention itself. So pairing our assessments of um, interventions with cultural adaptation models offers us a lot of opportunities to see what's done and where the opportunities lie to further our efforts. 
Thank you. Uh, so let me ask you about this. Were you at all surprised by anything that you saw as you reviewed the research for this article? Let's start with Kendall on this one. Yeah, what a great question. Um, I think that for me, a surprising result was related to that contextualization finding that Lakey was talking about, just that so many research articles that featured a predominantly racial or ethnic minority sample didn't mention issues related to race, issues related to ethnicity, inequity, disparities, or similarly relevant topics um, as part of the framing of the article. To me, that just seems like um, a missed opportunity to put the study findings in context and to just highlight those contextual adversities that were uniquely faced by the study participants. Thank you. Uh, Lakey, over to you, same question. Uh, we were all surprised by anything when you were reviewing the research for this article. Yes, I would echo that as well. Uh, that was a major point of reflexivity for uh, us as co-authors. Want to add that it wasn't necessarily surprising that there was more room to contextualize within studies. As we mentioned, 58% of studies offered some level, and that could include one sentence, right? But in actuality, the majority of studies had significant room to delineate, you know, important issues and explain important issues that were informing the study. 42% of articles made no mention at all, which is significant. And we, like I mentioned, had several reflexive dialogues to process our standard for coding and revise our standard for coding contextualization. But we kept going back to the importance of meeting the field where the field is at, while also coding these important variables and promoting greater attention to them in future studies. That would be the surprise and some takeaway. Thanks very much. Uh, my next question is about what areas in particular are there uh, opportunities and need for additional research? Mikey, let's start with you. So my answer here is uh, somewhat related to the last question. You know, based on this review uh, and previous reviews focusing on diversity and intersectionality and related issues in couple and family intervention research, I want to emphasize the importance of reporting. Uh, the field and relevant stakeholders would absolutely benefit from additional research that tracks documents and explicitly explains the methodology behind um, engaging racially and ethnically minoritized communities. More process papers on how we do this uh, could be could add a lot of information to the literature in terms of methodology. Thank you. Uh, Kendall, over to you, same question. What areas in particular do you see uh, opportunities or needs for additional research? Yeah, um, so looking forward, I think there's also a need for more research that uses participatory and community-based methods so that as researchers, we're truly working with um, diverse and underserved communities to to co-design, to co-implement, to co-evaluate our interventions. I think we also need more research um, efforts that are focused on sustainability right from the beginning so that when we get to the end and we have all our data collected and our findings published, that we really have a well-established plan in place for these interventions to stay within these communities so that community members can continue to benefit from them. Um, and then I also think that Moving forward, we really um, need to take advantage of the opportunity that we have as a field to um, anchor the research that we do in frameworks that really emphasize critical consciousness and social justice. Um, and I think that that really is going to mean thinking more critically about our research topics, thinking more critically about the populations and um, and what these things are and who these populations are in context. So for instance, um, how do I need to consider the impacts of historical trauma in the work that I do, in the work that I do personally with parents? Um, how do I create partnerships in communities when there are very real power dynamics operating um, 
when I, you know, come in as a member representing the university and kind of and, and everything that that entails and and how do I how do I navigate those relationships in ways that are are, are fair and, and equitable um, and like how can I truly do research in ways that are going beyond just perpetuating the status quo because we know that disparities continue to persist that is the status quo right so how can we conduct couple and family intervention research um, in ways that are actually promoting health equity and I think that these um, critical conscious frameworks are really going to um, provide us some some ideas for, for navigating that terrain moving forward. All right, thanks very much. Uh, anything else you'd like to add uh, now that we're sort of at the end here? You know, I will emphasize uh, Kendall's last point about relying on social justice uh, frameworks and critically conscious frameworks. Uh, we also see a movement toward anti-racist mental health care and anti-oppressive mental health care. And I think there's an added layer there in centering the real impact of racism, uh, not just in our country, but in our communities, in our families and in on our mental health. And engaging in anti-racist mental health care requires one, that acknowledgement and um, two strategies to understand how individuals, couples, families, and communities employ their own tactics of um, support, recovery, and healing. I think we would benefit from that uh, perspective in our mental health fields. All right, so my next question is, uh, what do these results of this research review mean for therapists? And Lincoln, could you kind of start us off with that? Yes, absolutely. So the results overall show that we are including racially and ethnically diverse communities in our research and mental health interventions, yet there's still much room to grow in terms of representation and in terms of attending to issues that affect the real lives and the mental health of racially minoritized and underserved populations. So considering disparate access to and use of evidence-based mental health interventions continues to beg the question of how individuals, families, and communities promote resilience internally and coping, right? And so I want to caution, one, not to overemphasize the expectation of resilience and coping uh, for underserved and historically oppressed communities, because that does perpetuate harm and the expectation of having to overcome adversity. And we want to, from an anti-racist and anti-oppressive and critically conscious place, acknowledge and honor the strengths that individuals, families, and communities come to therapy with, right? And so asking what those resources are, how folks feel supported, uh, who they feel supported around, uh, just to understand psychological and relational well-being while trying to understand um, how to support well-being or uh, the lack thereof is really, really important. And in order to do this, I really want to emphasize the importance of approaching our therapeutic relationships from non-hierarchical and more egalitarian uh, positions. So coming to the room with clients as the experts at on their lives and their experiences, and then, you know, understanding that we also have um, a wealth of of information and resources to share and improve mental health. So more egalitarianism, um, more strengths-based. Yes. Thanks so much. Uh, Kendall, same question to you. Uh, what do the results of this research review mean for therapists? Yeah, I think as therapists, this review is just another reminder of how systemic racism and marginalization um, kind of impact the context of our clinical work. So in this case, um, I think that we're seeing that our white clients really benefit from a greater number of evidence-based interventions and evidence-based practices that have been developed and tested for them compared to clients of other um, racial or ethnic minority backgrounds. So um, we need to be engaging in reflexive practice, I think, where we examine how our identities and our experiences. So for me, for instance, 
um, it might be my white privilege, how those identities and those experiences could be impacting how we engage with clients. And then we need to be holding ourselves um, accountable for knowing how to emphasize culturally honoring practices um, in our clinical work. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so this concludes our interview, and I want to just take a moment to say thank you to you both for taking part in our uh, Decade in Review series and providing such insightful commentary on the current state of research around mental health disparities among racially and ethnically diverse populations. Uh, your work on this will be invaluable in, in continuing to advance the profession of marriage and family therapy. I also want to say thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in today. We do hope you'll reach out to us with comments and questions. You can join the conversation with us online on Twitter by tagging at the AAMFT, that's at the AAMFT. Uh, visit the link on the screen to read this article and more from the Decade in Review issue, and we thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>